legal protections uh, that you are entitled to for your location information when the government comes seeking for it. Um, you know, I work at the ACLU and I spend my time challenging government surveillance programs and location information has been one of the most pressing uh, issues we've been dealing with for the last several years. Um, you know, and unfortunately, I'm going to continue on the theme that Chris just struck, which is that the legal protections for this type of information are both uncertain and inadequate. Um, technology has been changing incredibly rapidly, um, and I think it's worth um, pointing this out, right? We just learned uh, from a bunch of letters that Congressman Markey said, uh, was, you know, he requested information from cell phone companies and learned that the cell phone companies get 1.3 million uh, requests for data a year. What is so striking about that is that uh, you know, 20 years ago, none of this data would have existed. Uh, how many of you, for example, had a cell phone uh, in 1990? Right? There's just a few hands up in the audience right now. Most of us didn't. And so uh, the government and the FBI in particular com you know, frequently complain about the degree to which they're going dark. Right? Their surveillance capacities are being stymied by encryption and other technological protections. But the reality is that this is the golden age of surveillance that we all create these vast data traps that didn't exist before. Um, and, and for the law, this creates some, the, the, the relatively rapid nature of the way this has happened creates some real difficulties. Um, the law tends to evolve incredibly slowly. So for example, you know, the telephone was invented in the late 1800s. It was, 19, it was 1928 before the Supreme Court first weighed in on the question of whether or not the government needs a warrant to wiretap your phone. And it reached the wrong conclusion. It held that it didn't need a warrant based on probable cause, and it took until the 1960s for the Supreme Court to finally rule that if the government wants to listen in on your telephone conversation, it needs a warrant, right? You know, over 60 years that decision took. And so, um, you know, both the courts and the Congress have a lot of catch up to play to figure out how to deal with uh, legal protections for the location information that we generate in vast quantities every day. Um, there are a few different possible sources of legal protection, right? The courts can interpret the Constitution or existing laws to protect location information. Um, Congress can pass a new law. Um, you know, and there's a theoretical third source, right, which is some sort of executive restraint, right? The executive can simply say, well, we're, you know, we're not going to get this sense of information. That's obviously not happening, so there's, there's really just two possible sources. Um, so I'm going to start out for reasons which will hopefully soon become obvious by talking about the Constitution and what it may mean for protection for your location data from mobile carriers. Um, Ben started off by the Constitution, obviously, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, and the default rule is that if the government is carrying out a search, a constitutional search, it needs to get a warrant based on probable cause. Um, ben started out by mentioning the Supreme Court's recent decision in United States versus Jones. Um, I'm going to talk about it in a little more detail because this provides the best um, hope that the Supreme Court will find that you have a Fourth Amendment interest in your, lo your location information. Uh, a unanimous Supreme Court held that uh, when you attach, a, when law enforcement attaches a GPS device to your car, that is a search under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the case arose because the police wanted to track the movements of a nightclub dealer in Washington, D.C. They thought he was involved in drug dealing. Uh, they attached a GPS device to his car, and they actually they got a warrant, but it wasn't a valid warrant for reasons I will spare you. Uh, so he moved to suppress the evidence. The government made the sweeping argument Ben alluded to earlier that location information simply uh, doesn't implicate the Fourth Amendment at all. You have zero protections for your location information under the Fourth Amendment. And I think because of the extreme nature of that argument, the Supreme Court really took note of what the consequences of that would be um, and held that when they do that, there's a search under the Fourth Amendment. But Jones actually concerns me a lot, and it's because I am, uh, it's because of what the decision doesn't say more than what it does say. And I'm afraid that uh, you know, civil libertarians will see the court's decision in Jones and see that the court did something positive for protecting location privacy and will stop paying attention to this issue when really the decision doesn't go as far as we all wish it would. It leaves two essential questions unresolved. 
Number one, we know now that if you attach a GPS device to someone's car, that is a search under the Fourth Amendment. But the Supreme Court explicitly did not address the question of whether it is the type of search that requires a warrant based on probable cause, or whether some lesser standard will do. So the government, in the past six months since the Jones decision was decided, has filed briefs all around the country arguing that they don't need a warrant, even after Jones, to engage in this form of location tracking. It is sufficient if an officer has a reasonable belief that, you've, uh, that, that tracking your car will turn up evidence of wrongdoing. And they argue that they don't need to go to a judge. It is enough for the officer to simply believe, reasonably, that, they, that, that a search will turn up evidence of wrongdoing. That standard, in my opinion, is pretty meaningless and toothless. I think the primary value of the Fourth Amendment is the fact that if you are carrying out an investigation, you have to go to a judge, a neutral magistrate, and you explain why the search will turn up evidence of wrongdoing. And if all Jones means is that you have to think what you're doing is reasonable, it's not going to mean much, very much at all. The second major unresolved question is how Jones applies to mobile devices. Right. As, as Ben mentioned, the FBI, for example, says it's using 3,000 uh, GPS trackers. It was using 3,000 GPS trackers at the time the Jones decision was issued. But there are a lot more cell phone tracking going on. And it is not clear that the protections for location information against attaching a GPS to, device to someone's car are going to apply to cell phone tracking. And to understand why the decision is unclear, you have to look at the majority decision. I mean, the court unanimously held that there was a search, uh, but it didn't agree on the reason why there was a search. And five of the justices, uh, led by Justice Scalia, were uh, very, framed the issue in terms of a trespass, right? This is a common law trespass. An officer had to physically attach a device to your personal property, and that trespassed on your property, and there, when they collected information from it, therefore there was a search, right? It is not, that is obviously not how cell phone tracking works. The government goes to the company to get the information. And those justices uh, said, you know, we will leave for another day the, you know, whether or not it violates the Fourth Amendment to engage in purely electronic surveillance. So it's not clear that the good the court did in Jones for GPS tracking of cars will extend in any way to the mobile location tracking uh, that the government uh, finds much more useful. And in the law, there are actually some good reasons to believe. Uh, you know, the government's argument, the government continues to argue today that it does not implicate the Fourth Amendment to uh, track a cell phone without a warrant based on probable cause, or actually that, that they have to meet any Fourth Amendment standard at all. Do you want to explain what the government argues right now that they can get? I mean, what kind of location data they can get with, with a de-order? I mean, and you'll explain this, but what are the various standards for location data? When can, when can they get it? One tower, multi tower, GPS. Yeah, I'll get to that okay. in a second. I'm going to talk about the statutory scheme um, in just a moment. Um, but so, under the Constitution, the government believes um, that because there's no physical trespass when they want cell phone data, um, that the Fourth Amendment is simply not implicated and they continue to make that country, th that argument around the country. There's also, as Chris was just mentioning, um, federal statutory law that provides some protection for your electronic data. Uh, the bad news is that the statute has not been updated since 1986, right? That was before the World Wide Web was invented and before people really used cell phones. Um, and it is not clear how that statute applies to location data. Um, so, for example, the government argues, that the government has taken a, a litigation position um, that when it wants to get historical cell phone location information under this outdated statute, it is sufficient if it shows that that information is relevant to an ongoing investigation, um, it, relevant and material to an ongoing investigation, and it makes the same argument if it wants to engage in real-time single tower tracking. Um, they have taken the position that if they want to do more precise GPS tracking, the Department of Justice recommends um, that law enforcement agents get a warrant based on probable cause. However, um, they don't concede that the Constitution requires them to do that. They're just sufficiently afraid that judges might conclude that, that they suggest that you generally get a warrant. Um, so those are the, the sort of legal standards that apply under this statute. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to, to mention that um, in the wake 
Wickham Jones, we have been at the ACLU and the EMF and CDT and EPIC and other organizations have been trying to find every one of these location tracking cases and make the arguments in favor of requiring the probable cause requirement. Um, you know, but the battlefield often keeps shifting just as technology keeps shifting. So for example, right now we've been very focused on cell phone tracking, uh, but there are other forms of location tracking um, you know, when one form becomes less accessible, other forms become more accessible, and we've seen, for instance, automatic license plate readers um, pro popping up with greater frequency all around the country. Um, so that's a brief cool overview. Ben, did you want to? Yeah, I want to clarify one point. So the, the government's argument here is that single tower data is so inaccurate. It's just, I mean, it, it's just a little bit of information, but it's, it, you know, it doesn't tell them which, which apartment you're in or which house you're in. The government's argument is that because single tower data is so inaccurate, they don't need a warrant to get it. And this may have been the case 20 years ago or 15 years ago when they first started making the argument. Um, but they haven't adjusted their legal theories to the, the changes in technology. And so as consumers increasingly use modern smartphones that are data hungry, the carriers have to respond to the surge in data usage by placing more and more towers cities, and when you add more and more towers to a city, you have to shrink the coverage area around a tower. 